Hey guys, this is Nick, and as you might have noticed, Microsoft announced Windows 11, the latest release of their Windows operating system. Now, I'm not gonna make a dedicated video on Windows 11, because that's not the focus of this channel, but they still announced some interesting features, some that we do, and some that we don't do. And I think it's gonna be interesting to compare both implementations. Interesting? Just like today's sponsor, Shells.com. Shells gives you access to a full-on desktop, virtually, from any device that you want to use. It's compatible with Linux, with Windows, macOS, Android, iOS, and they have a desktop app, or you can use it in your web browser. The setup takes less than five minutes, account creation included. And then you can boot into any desktop you like, from your favorite Linux distro, like Ubuntu, Manjaro, MX Linux, OpenSUSE, or a Windows desktop, or even an Android one if that's what you prefer. So basically, Shells.com will give you access to any desktop that you need to test things up, to try things out, to deploy on, whatever you need it for. Pricing starts at $4.95 per month, but you can also spec out your own shell with a crazy number of virtual CPU cores and a crazy amount of RAM. You can also pick on which data center you want your shell to be hosted, and also they have automatic backups and snapshots. Now, if you want to run multiple systems without any performance cost to your actual device, click the link in the description below to learn more about Shells.com. Okay, now let's start with the first feature of Windows 11 that caught my eye, and that's support for Android apps. Now, sure, depending on whether you need Android apps on your desktop or not, will define however you're interested in that feature or not. But for me, it's a very interesting thing, and it opens up a lot of possibilities. Of course, Microsoft chose a debatable course of action by using the Amazon App Store as its Android app library. And you will have to create an Amazon account, but Android apps will run through a similar subsystem to Windows subsystem for Linux, which means that performance shouldn't be horrible at all. Now, they also chose to showcase TikTok, which is... Ugh. Now, Android app support is a feature that I wish our Linux desktops did or at least did better. You can use Anbox on Linux to try and run Android apps, but it's a clunky solution. It's based on an old Android version. It doesn't come with an app store, so you have to sideload apps, and it's not integrated with the system at all. Now, I think we could do something similar than what Microsoft is doing with Windows 11, but better. First, ditch the Amazon App Store. We can use the Aurora Store or even F-Droid if we prefer open source only apps. Second, integrate Android apps with our launchers, menus, docs, whatever we use on our Linux desktops. Third, integrate those Android apps inside of our various app stores. One click install for Android apps would be amazing. And fourth, we can base it all on the Android open source project and de-google it to hell just like slash e does, so we can have a good base, all the advantages of Android without all the spyware. Now, integrating Android apps out of the box on Linux would open the gates for having more choice in terms of what we can run, including games, the slimmed down Microsoft Office, some Adobe programs, social media apps, whatever you can imagine. Come on, don't you want to play Red Shadow Legends on your laptop? And speaking of Red Shadow Legends, this video is... No, no, I'm kidding. No, no, we're, we're not doing that. It would also help immensely the Linux mobile efforts. The ChinkPad A1, for example, will have Android app integration out of the box, and it instantly makes it a more appealing tablet. Basically, I think we should definitely work on an Android app integration with our Linux desktops. Optional, sure, for people who don't need it or don't want it, don't ship that in the ISO. But a one-click install for an Android subsystem for Linux that lets you install Android apps directly from your app store and run them as if they were native? Yes, yes, I think we could use that. Now, the second feature I found interesting is the tiling. Because nobody else lets you do this with this many windows. No. And yeah, sure, Microsoft has conveniently forgotten that we've been doing that for years. Tiling window managers have existed since whenever, and Pop! OS does auto-tiling as well, and most the most basic desktop environments will let you snap your windows to the corner of the screens, to the edges of the screen. It's just something that we have learned to use a lot. But Microsoft has done it, in my opinion, in a more user-friendly and accessible solution than what we've been doing for years. First, the solution is discoverable. You just need to hover over the Maximize button, which is something you're going to do a lot as soon as you want to maximize a window. Second, they offer pre-made layouts, so you can get a feel of what you can do with this feature. Just by looking at the pop-up, you can see what windows could be arranged in various configurations, and that can give you ideas if you've never thought about organizing your windows. Third, they remember application pairings through this styling. 
If you move to another app, another virtual desktop, or just disconnect your laptop from your external monitor, your application pairings and tiling will be kept, and you can return to them just by using the taskbar. Now, I think this implementation makes sense for regular users. The average computer user doesn't use the keyboard to interact with their windows, they use the mouse. Now seriously, I wouldn't even call myself a regular user, and I use the mouse to interact with my windows. PopOS's auto-tiling feature is pretty close to what Windows 11 offers, but it doesn't offer pre-made layouts, and it just auto-tiles everything for you. You'll have to manually create the layout you want. It's powerful, it's really good, but it's less user-friendly. So in the end, Microsoft took a pre-existing idea, but they just did it better, in my opinion, in a more user-friendly, more discoverable way, and I think we should take notice of that. Now, it's okay to admit that somebody did something we already did better than we already did. Now the next Windows 11 feature that we could take a note of is the design. No, sorry, it looks good in screenshots, but in use it's still an incoherent mess. Now, in terms of gaming, Windows already has the advantage over Linux. Like Proton is a game changer, pun totally intended, but yeah, it doesn't run everything, especially anything based on anti-cheat. And with Windows 11, Microsoft is widening the gap again with two main features. The first one is Direct Storage. It's an API that lets games transfer the assets they need to load in, like textures or complex 3D models, directly to the GPU, instead of using the CPU. This will speed things up considerably. Now, it's a DirectX 12 API, so maybe we can replicate that with VKT3D, but it seems to require specific hardware, so maybe there's a driver implementation needed as well, maybe on the NVIDIA driver side or on the Mesa side, or maybe even in the Linux kernel to control where the assets are going and what the pipeline is really. The second nice feature is the Auto HDR. This basically takes older games that haven't got any HDR support and applies a few transformations to the color space so that they look a bit better than they used to and make use of a greater dynamic range. It's not going to be as nice as real baked-in HDR, but it still improves visual quality quite a bit on all the titles. Yeah, like we needed any other excuse to replay Skyrim. This one seems very feasible on Linux as well. It's just a processing layer that you apply on top of each frame that the game is generating. So that's probably something that we could get to if anybody has the time, the skills and the inclination to work on that. Now it's time like these that I really want to start learning how to code. Now, of course, Windows 11 being made by Microsoft doesn't do just interesting things. They also do the arbitrary feature removal and restrictions, which we should definitely not take inspiration from. First is the hardware requirements. Windows 11 won't install on older PCs, basically anything older than an Intel Core 8 Gen or Ryzen 2000 CPU that won't support it. You also need TPM 2.0, which still isn't omnipresent in relatively recent devices. This will limit the number of computers that can really upgrade, even though there seems to be an unpatched way right now to bypass that. Of course, Linux should not take inspiration from this and stay as widely compatible as it can. Microsoft also arbitrarily removed a bunch of features. You won't be able to move the taskbar from the bottom of the screen, you can't create application folders and groups anymore in the start menu, and the timeline feature is just gone. Now this is definitely not something we should take inspiration from either. Removing features that users have been gotten used to, have integrated into their workflows, is just not a good idea. Wait, I see you back there, trying to say that GNOME 3 removed features? Take a look at the initial implementation of GNOME 3 and compare it with GNOME 40. I think you'll find that they added features and settings, not removed them. And that's about it. Now, I have no intention of using Windows 11 either on a dual boot or on a VM or whatever. I have no use for Windows. But let's not be too close-minded. Microsoft sometimes happens to do good things in terms of UX or in terms of user features. And we should probably take a look at that and see how we can implement that in our own desktops. And also, huge thanks to Slimbook for being a partner of the channel. These guys are based in Spain, they will ship computers anywhere in the world with any keyboard layout, and they have laptops and desktops for basically any price range and any need. I literally only use their computers now. My desktop is from Slimbook, my laptop is from Slimbook, and my keyboard is also the RGB Slimbook keyboard. So if you need a device pre-installed with Linux, just take a look at the link in the description below and find the model that suits you. 
And that concludes it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like and subscribe. And if you didn't, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. You can also watch all my stuff on Odyssey. And if you want to help me go full time on YouTube and make more content, you can subscribe to my Patreon account or to YouTube and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.